We bought the property all cash, renovated it all cash, and then we would go and refinance it out um, a couple, you know, whenever, whenever the property was, was finished because the bank didn't have any seasoning periods. So we were able to pull the money, the money right out and use it for the next deal. Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now, let's get to it. Hey, our sponsor for the show today is Pine Financial Group, the leader in hard money lending in Colorado and Minnesota. And they were recently approved to offer their investment publicly. This investment offer is only for investors in Colorado and Minnesota and is only made through their investment prospectus. Get your copy today. Simply visit www.pineinvestments.com and click to get started. Look, there's a reason why some of the wealthiest people in history invest in loans backed by real estate. Learn more about the risks and returns at www.pineinvestments.com. Hello and welcome back to Pillars of Wealth Creation. I'm your host, Todd Dexter. I'm with me today. I'm excited to have Antoine Martel today. How are you doing? Awesome. How are you? I am fantastic. and Looking forward to uh, talking with with Antoine learning a little bit more about kind of what he's go, got going on. But first, a little bit about Antoine's background. He's got a portfolio of over 100 single family homes and counting. He's now involved in several uh, apartment complexes. Antoine helps new and seasoned investors realize their financial goals. His proven real estate investment strategies have enabled countless clients throughout California to realize passive income and financial freedom through out-of-state turnkey rental properties. His company, Martel Turnkey, has sold well over 100, sorry, $10 million worth of cash flow in real estate, and their sales are expected to double over the next year. So you will be at $100,000 in no time. Yeah. <laughs> Hope so. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, with that said, why don't you give our listeners a little bit more about your background, kind of where you came from and then sure. what your main focus is on today. Sure. So I'm 24 years old. I started investing in real estate about five years ago. Um, back when I was in university, my brother took me and my dad to like a real estate seminar. We learned about flipping houses, all that kind of stuff, how to run the numbers. Uh, we realized that it was something we were interested in and we tried to do it here in Los Angeles, but quickly realized with, you know, my dad's 40 grand saved up. There wasn't much that we can do here in LA or California in general. Yeah. Even if we went out to the middle of nowhere, California, the number still didn't make sense. So what we started doing or what I started doing, um, is just researching what other people were doing, how to get in real estate with 50 grand, 40 grand, 20 grand, 10 grand, what people were doing and learning about wholesaling, flipping houses out of state, rental properties, all that kind of stuff. And then started really just researching going out of state and which markets to invest in and where the hell can you buy a house for less than 40 grand and, you know, and then refinance it and do the whole burst strategy. So my last year of university, I went to Memphis, took my dad's 40 grand, bought a house for 35 grand, renovated it for five grand. So all in for 40 grand. And then it was worth, you know, 55,000 bucks after went to a local credit union, pulled the money out and give my dad his money back. And then said, Hey, I can keep doing this after graduating, just cover my living expenses for, let me try to figure this thing out. And we, he did that. And then by the end, I graduated in May, by the end of that year, we had like 10 single family homes in Memphis that were all cash flowing that portfolio. Then, you know, was able to allow me to keep working on the business because now all the cash flow was paying for my living expenses, which was great. And then people started so, reaching. I'm going to interrupt you real quick. So sure. <clears throat> when you were in, when you did that first property, did you actually go to Memphis no. then? No. Okay. I didn't physically go there. I think we bought like three or four properties just all remotely. Yeah. And just and built a team on the ground. Yeah. Were you guys doing the remodeling them with your team or were you just going turnkey? No, we didn't buy turnkey. We, I would we buy a, yeah, buy a house with a local agent. Yeah. And then we had a crew that we just used on the first house that came from a referral from that property management company we had lined up. 
the property management company had their contractor go out. They did the renovation. As soon as the renovation was done, then property management went, took photos, gotcha. listed it for rent. So no, it wasn't, it wasn't a turnkey thing. We were actually doing, you know, but, and we bought the property all cash, renovated it all cash. And then we would go and refinance it out. Um, a couple, you know, whenever, whenever the property was, was finished cause the bank didn't have any seasoning periods. So we were able to pull the money, the run, money right out and use it for the next deal. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. And then once we had that small portfolio, friends and family started reaching out to us to how the hell do we invest in real estate in Memphis, Tennessee, you know, all the way from California. And that's when our turnkey business started. So instead of refinancing the houses now, we just, I made a website called martellfamilyrealty.com and just started selling houses on the website. Uh, it was just more of a landing page for a bunch of people to, so we can email out a link instead of all the information in the email. Yep. And then people started buying houses from us, friends and family, and we would help them get financing and insurance and give them the whole team on the ground. And that's kind of when the property management company, the turnkey business started Martel turnkey. And then now that company does over a hundred homes a year is what we were doing. And so you guys are, are you actually taking title of the house and then doing the renovations and then selling them or are you partnering with people? Nope. All of the deals on our website, we own in our own LLCs that we have created. So all the, we're not selling anybody else's stuff. We're not a turnkey broker or anything like that. Uh, all the properties are owned with our, our own money. And you're just partnering then with people that want to be a part of it. Is that, is that the turnkey part or am I not understanding it? No. So the, the way the turnkey business works is we'll go out and buy a house for mm -hmm. with our money. So we'll go out, buy a house, renovate it, rent it out, put the property management company in place, and then we'll put it up on our website. A client will come, we'll buy that house for 80 grand. We'll help them get financing and insurance, give them the property management company. And then, so they'll come out of pocket, you know, 20% down, a couple thousand bucks in closing costs for like $20,000 to buy one of those properties that's already cash flowing. Okay. So that's the turnkey, the, the product that we're selling to our clients. Okay. And what, so what percentage, when you're looking at your business, what percentages are uh, that business model versus the percentage of you keeping it in house? Uh, continuing to yeah yeah so when we first started it was probably around like uh 60 percent sale rate and then 40 percent hold but now we pretty much all the single families 95 percent of them are sold instead of being kept gotcha. the only ones that we do keep are the ones where the appraisal comes back bad something horrible happens with the house and it's going to be super delayed um, or we just have a tenant that we need to try to evict. So it's more just like delayed properties or properties where there's some headache that we have to uh, uh, remediate. Then we'll keep those properties in the meantime. Because The reason why that huge shift is because we started to buy apartment buildings instead. Just because when you have some ex, you know, more cash, more than 20 or 40 or 50,000 bucks, then it makes more sense with the scale to get into the multifamily side of things. So we kind of stayed away from the single family home portfolio for our personal portfolio and started buying apartment buildings instead. Well, let's, let's talk about that. So you're buying apartment buildings. What, what kind of size apartment buildings are you guys focusing on right now? So anything from 10 units to 30 units right now. So okay. we just made our biggest purchase, which was last two weeks ago, which was 24 unit building, gotcha. but anything kind of in that range, the reason why that, We'd like to do bigger. It's just we found a little sweet spot or a, a neighborhood that we really like in Memphis where there's just no, no building in that neighborhood is over 50 units. Uh, a lot of them are like in the 20 unit range. So we've just been, we found a little niche that we liked and we just kept on buying apartment after apartment, you know, kind of next to each other in that same neighborhood. And are you doing the same strategy with those? Are you guys buying them, doing some renovations to them? And, uh, or are you just buying them where they're already teed up? Good question. So we're, <coughs> we're buying them heavy value add, renovating them. Like one of the buildings, we just did an 11 unit and the rents when we bought it were 450. And now we've renovated all the units. <laughs> we bought the building. So it's 11 units. We bought it for 450 grand. We got financing on it, of course. And then we spent like 150 grand on the exterior, uh, paint, 
um, new landings, new handrails, all that good stuff. And then renovated all the interior units, spent around 10 grand per unit. And we made the rents 450 when we bought it to 900 now where the rents are. So huge wow. value add, huge rental, yeah. huge rental increases. And then we're, once those buildings are done, then if it's a smaller building, like the 11 unit, we'll probably sell it on the turnkey website. If it's a larger building that's in an area we think is going to grow, then we'll probably just hold it, refinance it and take the cash out and then hold it ourselves. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, and then are, are these done through syndication, through partnerships, through your own capital? How, how are you Got it. doing that? Yeah. So the first couple <laughs> apartment buildings we did were with our own money. We'd rather we haven't done an apartment building before. So we were like, all right, let's do this with our own cash before we start bringing in investors into this thing. And cause if all hell breaks loose, then our name's going to have a bad rep for it. Right. So we did the first two buildings, a 20 unit and an 11 unit with our own money. Then I made some case studies for that. And then I was like, all right, this is our model. And we got our model down and you know, our color palette and what we do to the units and all that kind of stuff down. So I made a case study for those couple of things. And then, all deals after that, which we've bought a, a 24 unit and now we're buying a 16 unit this Friday. Those are with not syndication, but more with just like joint venture partners. So gotcha. one to two investors that have a hundred grand or more, typically they come in and just get an ownership percentage of the, of the deal. Um, and yeah, they partner with us. It's just easier for us. We don't have to we don't have to do all the legal stuff like that. It's just worked out between our lawyers and theirs. Um, Cause we're yeah. not, we don't have like, you know, 40 investors in one deal that, you know, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, and are you living in Memphis or are you living in California? No, I live in, I live in California still. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So do it all, do all this remote. That's awesome. Um, well, how, how are you? So you're living in California. A lot of people, get nervous about stuff like that. You know, you're in California, yeah. these properties are out of state. How do you, how are you controlling that to where you know yeah. you're getting good solid deals in the right neighborhoods? Yeah. So it's a combination of having a really good team, but then also trusting, but verifying. So we put a lot of like checks and balances on, on the ground, especially when we were first starting. So Hey, this person says this is a good neighborhood. Okay, great. But let's call 20 other brokers and see what they say. Or let's call all the other property management companies and see what they say. Mm -hmm. If 19 out of the 20 property management companies say, yeah, it's a great area for rentals, then, you know, it's probably going to be a good area for rental properties. Um, if, you know, only two of them say that and the other 18 say that's the ghetto, then you may want to look and find another neighborhood, right? So doing a lot of research from, uh, afar is, you know, it takes a lot of time, but it's, it's well worth it. And you have to do that being out of state. And then also setting up your team on the ground, making everybody kind of, uh, have the same, uh, goal in mind and everybody kind of sharing the same goal of, you know, doing more and more properties, scaling up the business, which is going to then make them more money. So kind of, Hey, this is not just a one-time project kind of thing. We're actually looking to do, you know, 10 houses a month or, you know, grow a scalable business with you guys on the ground. Um, yeah. So those are all things that kind of having people just looking long-term and not trying to make, you know, an extra two grand here or two grand there. Um, we're just helping these people look kind of long-term and then making sure that they're, they have the same incentives as us to make it successful. Yeah. One of the things I found important cause I, I invest out of state as well is, yeah. you know, we don't want to obviously spend the most amount of money as we possibly can on construction. But you also don't want to nickel and dime these these uh, contractors because once yeah. you start doing that, it's no longer a, a win win, and yep. they're not going to be looking forward to doing work for you. They're going to be looking for other work to do um, that they can do without you. And so they might do a couple projects. You might get them done for really cheap. You might, you know, they might get done okay. But eventually, I'll, you'll get caught, and you'll get one of the contractors that maybe has done one or two projects for you and even done well all of a sudden you find that nothing's getting done on time. Yeah. It's just things aren't going the way they should be. And you end up having to fire them. You scratch your head. Well, typically it's the reason is because they found other work that they would yeah. rather do. That's going to pay them more. That's going to feed their you know family. Yeah. And so you, you've got to create a win-win with, with every 
you know, team member partner uh, that you bring on board on these, on these. I deals agree. Stay. I agree. Yeah. And one, one thing that like I keep at the forefront when I'm talking to these people, like even just property management or everybody on the ground who, you know, probably met me three to four times over the last couple of years um, to keep them, you know, working with me over and over again, it's just be very easy to work with. So, yeah. Hey, if it's, you know, if it's something under 500 bucks, then just get it done. Let's just get it done. Let's just get it done and just keep pushing the project, you know, forward and forward. And, you know, on the contractor's bids for me, if the number, if the number works, then I'm just going to accept the bid and, and get it done. Right. But there's a lot of other guys in California or just out of state that are investing and they, Oh, well, last time he gave us a thousand buck list down. Let's try to get one here again. Let's try to get it. Do the number and the numbers still work at the price point. They're just trying to scrape every penny nickel and dime the contractors, like you said. Yeah. So same thing for us. We, we just try to be very easy to work with, with everybody too, the lender, the escrow company. And we kind of set up our whole system in place to be the easiest client for all these people to work with. Cause then they're going to enjoy working with us, which means they're going to work harder and they'll work on Saturdays and Sundays because you know, we, they know we're not going to, you know, pinch them here and there. We're going to make their life uh, less miserable. Hey, let's take a minute to thank our sponsor, Pine Financial Group. Look, you work hard for your money. Is your money working hard for you? Because of inflation, money sitting idle erodes your wealth. Many investors understand that real estate is a great investment, but may not want the effort or the risk that comes with owning their own property. They want to sit back and have payments hit their bank account each and every month. Stop eroding your wealth and start building by asking your money to work for you. You should be earning profits while you sleep in investment backed by real estate. Pine Financial Group, the leader in hard money lending in Colorado and Minnesota was recently approved to offer their investment publicly. This investment offers only for investors in Colorado and Minnesota and is only made through the investment prospectus. Get your copy today. Simply visit www.pineinvestments.com and click to get started. There's a reason why some of the wealthiest people in history invest in loans backed by real estate. Learn more about the risks and returns at www.pineinvestments.com. It's www.pineinvestments.com. One of the things that you said, I thought that was really good. And this just shows the power of, you know, networking and building strong relationships too. But you mentioned that when you're looking at a property and especially in a new neighborhood that you might not have invested in, you're getting more than just one property manager, more than just one broker to tell you their opinions on that mm -hmm. area. And I think that's so powerful because any sales broker that's actually selling the property is likely going to tell you the neighborhood's pretty good, right? Of course. You're selling the property. <laughs> uh, but if you take their opinion, you might find yourself uh, maybe not as pleasantly surprised as what you're hoping to. So oh, yeah. I really like what you said there as far as verifying with several different brokers, property managers, yeah. and so on. Yeah. Yeah. For the way that I, so I did my research when I went to Memphis, I mean, not went to Memphis, when I did my research on Memphis and realized it was a good market, the next thing was building the team. Literally what I did was went to Zillow, went to the top rated agents and I called 200 of the agents mm. and asked them, Hey, I'm a real estate investor. I want to start buying rental properties in Memphis. What neighborhood would you recommend? Can you set me up on a drip campaign? Um, what kind of rents can those properties get in those neighborhoods? And then you just collect data from, 200 of the top guys in Memphis, you got a pretty good picture of what's going on, right? Yeah. And where the investors are investing. And then out of that list of 200, you know, maybe you have five or 10 guys that you actually, you know, think you could enjoy working with, et cetera. Um, and then you start, you call those people back and you respond to those people's drip system. But, you know, yeah, trusting and verifying and taking as much an aggregate of data and I, would, I thought that calling the top 200 guys in Memphis real estate was a pretty good idea to get a good picture, a good glimpse of what was going on. Yeah. And it helps you find the right people too, to, to oh, yeah. bring onto your team. So, you know, you're, you're, you said you're 24, you started this when you're 19. So you haven't, uh, you don't have a ton of history behind you. You're young still, but oh. 
my guess is you've made a mistake or two along the way. What's a big mistake that you've made or a bigger mistake that you've made and how have you learned from it? Yeah, good question. So one of the biggest ones was probably just overconfidence um, in myself and in building a team out of state. Mm. It's really, trust me, it's really hard to find a good solid team out of state. Yeah. I've literally sat down with people for three to six months on a bi-weekly basis trying to help them just because they were good friends of mine. I wanted to help them do their own thing. And they've tried it and they've been in that market for a year and it's still been unsuccessful. And they haven't found the same kind of guys that I found in Memphis and Cleveland. And I don't know what it was, but um, I think that the biggest mistake that I made was I was in, I was doing stuff in Memphis. We had those 10 single family homes. Then it was now 2018 and we started going into different neighborhoods, like uh, different markets, sorry. So Cleveland, Ohio, we added that as a market because it just, the numbers made sense. There was good neighborhoods. We found a good team there, et cetera. Shortly after, like we were in Cleveland, I was like, Hey, Akron's pretty close. And that's pretty high on my, I made a spreadsheet of like the top 50 or hundred cities for rental properties and did a bunch of research, blah, blah, blah. And Akron was pretty high on that list as well. And I noticed it was right next to Cleveland. I was like, Oh, this would be great. We can just add Cle add Akron to a market. And then when we go visit, it'll just be a quick drive to Akron and I will have two, two markets for the price of one kind of. And so and I think it was, it was literally like over two or three business days. <clears throat> I just sat there calling people. And I think it was one of the first couple of phone calls that I made to a property management team and pretty much explained to them everything we were doing and in the other markets and asked them if they wanted to help us do the same thing in Akron. And uh, yeah, it was literally like three to five phone calls in and I was like, all right, these are the guys and we're good to go. And let's just start making offers on properties now. And, was just didn't do as much due diligence as I had done on Memphis and Cleveland and kind of just got ahead of myself and felt like I was the best person ever at building a team out of state, which obviously wasn't because that first deal was, uh, was a hell hole. So the contractor was missing stuff. They didn't manage the contractor. Well, they were charging us the property management company left and right for trip charges and up charges and trying to upsell us on things and, um, they just weren't the right team for us. So that's probably the, the biggest mistake that I made was, and it was, I think it was good because it happened pretty early on and it kind of just, uh, you know, humbled me a little bit and that I wasn't the best out of state investor ever, um, <laughs> to kind of take my time and do my due diligence on these people. And, um, you know, people can be good on the phone, but you know, when they show up to work the next day, they may be a different person. Yeah. <clears throat> so not forgetting, what got you to where you're at. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, yeah, yeah, that's, that's what true. it sounds like. I mean, you, yeah. you did your research and due diligence and you're in Memphis and then in Cleveland and all of a sudden you think, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I got, I'm good. Yeah. I'm, I'm good. I know what I'm doing and I'm not going to follow the same rules. And once you start following different rules and you think you yeah. got it all made, that's when you start to make mistakes. And very true. Yeah. Um, so are you in that market still or no. did you exit out of it? No, we, we just, we left it and then yep. we started, we went back to Memphis and Cleveland and started instead just focusing on drilling deeper in those yeah. markets instead of yeah. going horizontally. Now, like the turnkey company, we do probably 80% of all the turnkey homes that we do is in Cleveland. So mm -hmm. we've actually just been cutting fat and we stopped doing the turnkey stuff in Memphis and started just buying apartments there. So we're getting really even more focused now, which I think was a better, uh, a better strategy than trying to go horizontally and having all these, you know, five different teams and five different markets kind of thing. Yeah. Well, as you've already alluded to building teams is very difficult. So that that's what I would suggest to anybody that wants to invest in a different market than yeah. the one they're living in is you've got to build a team and even in the market you're in. If you, yeah. even when you live there and building teams is the most difficult thing. I mean, having the right yeah. people in place and if you don't have them, that can be the, it's the and that's the kiss of death for a property yeah. is not having the right people in place. Yeah, I agree. Um, so somebody that's, that's maybe, you know, younger that wants to get started in this business, what are like three pieces of advice you could give them for getting started going from, you know, nothing or very little to yeah. building something like you have. Yeah. So for me, I think the, the biggest thing was networking and then working my ass off learning as much as I possibly could. Cause mm -hmm. 
there's three things. There's either you have time, money, or knowledge. So if you're young, you don't have money, so but you have time and you, you can go and get the knowledge with that time. So that's kind of what I focused on. And then, you know, with the networking part is where you can find the money. Um, and that's what I did for me. Luckily it came from my dad, but it was because I worked my ass off learning as much as I could. And I was, you know, the real estate expert in, in not expert, but yeah, you know, learning as much as I put more than my dad knew about more than it. your dad. Right. Exactly. Um, I was the expert for my dad or for the family about real estate and real estate investing. Yeah. And so, you know, finding those people that are close to you that may have some money and then being that person for them and going and learning as much as you possibly can and setting up a plan and a team in place. And then where the last thing you need is just the money and capital to be able to do that. Um, I think that's probably the, the best advice I can give. And I spent a lot of time on bigger pockets podcast bigger pockets forums. There's a bunch of real estate podcasts like this one, which are great fountains of information um, uh, as well, because you kind of hear everybody's story about how they went from zero to one, which I think is the most important going from one house a month to 10 houses a month is, is easy. It just takes time and, and more money, but uh, going from zero to getting that first house and building that first team is really what, I just went and tried to find that information over and over and over again through podcasts mostly um, because they're short 30 minute things where you can get somebody's full story about how they did it in, in 30 minutes where it would take a whole book to figure out the same information. Yeah. There's so much great information out there today. It's totally different than even when I started, which wasn't that long ago. I mean, 2008, yeah. so it was 11 years ago, but there was no, real information like there is now as far as yeah, this yeah. podcasts go and even yeah. audio books and stuff like that, yeah, uh, blogs true. and all that. So it's, it's totally different. What's your favorite? Uh, so you, you did big, a lot of podcasts, a lot of bigger pockets. That, that was one of my questions is how, how did you learn? I know you said you went to some course um, yeah. on flipping, but you guys really didn't flip. I mean, you kind of are using some of that modeling, but yeah. um, you're keeping. So what, what was your favorite resource and then a follow-up question, what's your favorite uh, business or real estate book? Got it. Um, yeah, so my, well, my favorite way to get the knowledge was definitely through the podcast. Those were the best way that I found to get the information. And then my favorite book, I actually wrote a book about what I did and how I did it. And it's on Amazon. So if you just search my name on Amazon, it'll come up. There's a couple of other books though, uh, which has probably been said on here before. Robert Kiyosaki was a really good one. And then Grant Cardone has a free book about real estate investing, which is okay. And then there's also um, David Lindholz, Multifamily Millions, if people want to learn about multifamily. It was a really good book about the power of, of multifamily yeah. real estate. Kind of opened, opened up my eyes to, to that side of things. Awesome. Yeah. All, all, all good books. I have not seen the uh, Grant Cardone uh, free ebook or whatever, uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, Kiyosaki obviously and and uh, Lindell is, is excellent. Anybody wanting to get involved in multifamily needs to read Multifamily Millions, an awesome book. Yep. Um, so, what are your guys' goals moving forward? You're, you, you've got this turnkey thing going on, you've got yep. the apartments you're, lo- you're buying. What's kind of your goals moving forward? Where are you going to take this thing? So, the turnkey business, it's working, it's working well. Uh, until the market crashes, I'm not sure what's going to happen. There may be a lot of scared money out there and people may not want to buy turnkey. So uh, the goal is to just keep scaling the turnkey business um, and then to get into a larger and larger apartment building. So we have a couple of buildings, like those first couple ones that we bought that we're looking to refinance in 2020, which will give us some cash to go and buy more apartment buildings and then also put some money back into Martel turnkey to keep growing. So we will do around a hundred homes this year. And then I think we're going to shoot for like 150 homes next year. And we bought about a hundred units of apartments or 90 units of apartments this year. And then looking to double that as well next year, maybe do 150 apartments as well. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so I got two more questions for you. Uh, what are your three pillars of wealth creation? Three pillars of wealth creation in terms of actual money or in terms of 
<laughs> and that's the beauty of the question. It's, it's open-ended. <laughs> so you can decide however you want to uh, answer that and, and close that off. Wealth creation. I, would, I would say number one would be my network that I built over the last five years. That's probably the, yeah. the biggest one. I mean, the, all of these, for example, like those multifamily deals that we've been doing, the reason I was able to do them was because of my network and I wouldn't be able to mm-hmm. even have a piece of that deal. Um, and I, I was a young kid going to these meetings as well, but I just knew my stuff. So people trusted me and it didn't really matter what my age is. Cause that's what a lot of people are using yeah. as an excuse. Yeah. Um, so I would say that's one of them. I would say the turnkey business would be another pillar of wealth creation. Um, not only for me and my family and everybody that works for the company, but also for people who are buying the turnkey rentals. I think it's a great way to get started into real estate. I don't think it's a great long-term plan, but I think it's a good way for people to dip their toes into real estate, taste Mm. how it feels to invest out of state. Do you like it? Do you hate it? (laughs) And then figure out if you want to keep scaling that, go and buy multifamily apartments or buy more turnkeys, et cetera. Third pillar of wealth creation would be probably just the cash flow from the apartment buildings that we've been buying. Um, so I would say that would be probably the the third pillar of wealth creation. That's very long term. Those buildings take a lot of cash to get started, and normally they don't cash flow for us since we're doing heavy value add for the first year. But I know long term those are going to be uh, that's going to pay off with all the cash flow they'll create. Awesome. Awesome. Last question is how can our listeners connect with you, learn more about what you're doing and get to know you? Awesome. So I'm big on Instagram. I have, I post a ton of content there so you can follow me there at Martel Antoine. Um, I wrote a book, like I said, which is on Amazon. You can just search my name, Antoine Martel. And then I have a podcast as well, a millennials guide to real estate investing we email just a bunch of millennials who have started or are in real estate. Cool. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. Well, Antoine, really appreciate uh, all the advice you're able to give us and have fun Thank having you. you on the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Have an excellent day. You too. Hey, thanks for listening to the show. A couple things before we go again, go on to our Facebook page, Pillars of Wealth. We'd love to have you on there. Go on to iTunes, give us a rating and review and subscribe to the show. Also, um, you know, don't forget, reach out to me if you want any help with uh, potentially growing your business and reach out to John Styles to help you buy or sell real estate. Thanks for listening. We appreciate it. Have a fantastic the rest of the day. And as I say, make every day a Saturday.